Turn your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 33. As we return to our studies in the book of Genesis, we'll read chapter 33 of Genesis, verse 18, all the way to chapter 34, verse 31. Verse 18 of chapter 33. Now Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padamaram and come before the city. He bought the piece of land where he had pitched his tent from the hand of the sons of Hamor. Shechem's father for one hundred pieces of money. Then he erected there an altar and called it El Eloi Israel. Now Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. When Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hebite, the prince of the land saw her, he took her and lay with her by force. He was deeply attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, Get me this young girl for a wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob kept silent until they came in. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very angry. Because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. For such a thing or not to be done. But Hamor spoke with them saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Intermarry with us. Give your daughters to us. And take our daughters for yourselves. Thus, you shall live with us, and the land shall be open before you. Live and trade in it, and acquire property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, If I find favor in your sight, I will give whatever you say to me. Ask me ever so much bridal payment and gift, and I will give according as you say to me. But give me the girl in marriage. But Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor with deceit. Because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. They said to them, we cannot do this. To give our sister to one who is uncircumcised. For that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you. If you will become like us, in that every male of you be circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters for ourselves, and we will live with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and go. Now these words seem reasonable to Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. The young man did not delay to do the thing because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was more respected than all the household of his father. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city saying, These men are friendly with us. Therefore, let us live in the land and trade in it. For behold, 
The land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage and give our daughters to them. Only on this condition will the men consent to us, to live with us, to become one people. Let every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock and their property and all their animals be ours? Only let us consent to them and they will live with us. All who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gates of his city. And it came about on the third day, when they were in pain, that two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came upon the city unawares and killed every male. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went forth. Jacob's sons came upon the slain and looted the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and they captured and looted all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives, even all that was in their houses. Then Jacob said, to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and my men being few in number, they will gather together against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed, I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister? As a harlot. Now in our previous studies of the book of Genesis, we have considered Jacob's transformation or change of direction in Peniel as he returns to the land of Canaan from exile in Haran. But we must never think that that transformation, that change of direction, leading to the changing of his name by God himself, would mean sinless perfection. And here again, in this portion read, we find another blemish in Jacob's life and character as head of the family. And as we open up and apply the passage, I want us to highlight the theological reflections intended by the writer and the applications of Jacob's settlement in Shechem. And there are four. The first is the importance of keeping a vow. The importance of Keeping a vow. Although this is not an issue that the narrator or writer under the infallible guidance of the Spirit explicitly mentions in the narrative as an editorial comment, it is something clearly implied in the way that the writer narrates the story and the events that unfolded. Note the introduction of the tragic event in Shechem in chapter 33 and verse 18. Here you have to look at your Bibles with me. Now Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, and he came from Padam Aram and camped before the city. He bought the piece of land where he had pitched his tent from the hand of the sons of Hamor. Shechem's father for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected there an altar and called it El Eloi Israel. As Jacob returns from exile in Haran or from Haran, 
after his encounter with God in the Jabok River, and after, move, after the moving reconciliation he had with his brother Esau, we are told that he arrived safely in Shechem, which is a city in the land of Canaan. And what did Jacob do? He settles down in Shechem. Camps before the city, literally in the sight of the city. And he even buys a piece of land where he pitched his tent from the sons of from the son of Hamor, Shechem's father. And he builds an altar there and called it El Elohi Israel or God, the God of Israel. And you ask, what is wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Well, if you know how the story is told and connects it back to what had been told before when Jacob fled from Canaan to Haran, and you will see the answer. When Jacob fled from the land of Canaan out of fear of what Esau, his brothers, would do to him, he made a vow to the Lord. And what was his vow? Well, turn back to Genesis 28. In Genesis 28, Verse 10. Then Jacob, fleeing from Canaan because of the murderous plot of his brother Esau, then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set and he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and he lay down in that place. He had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, the land of which you lie. I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and in all, in your seed, all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stone that he had put, under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. He called the name of that place Bethel, house of God. However, previously, the name of the city had been loose. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me on this journey and I that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear. And I return to my father's house in safety. Then the Lord will be my God. This stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Loose which Jacob renames as Bethel, God's house, was the place of God's special presence. God appeared in his special presence to Jacob in that place. And this vow that Jacob makes marks the site of where Jacob should worship 
the Lord. And where he would settle. But upon Jacob's return from Haran back to the land of Canaan, after many years, the author tells us that Jacob settles in Shechem. Not Bethel, where the Lord appeared to him in a dream previously. And he failed to fulfill immediately his vow to the Lord to worship God in that place where God appeared to him in a dream. And Jacob's lingering in Shechem, not immediately fulfilling his vow, led to a tragic incident in Shechem. You see, he was not just passing through Shechem. When he came, he bought a land where he pitched his tent. He intended to stay there, to linger in Shechem. If Jacob did not linger in fulfilling his vow to the Lord, this tragic incident in Shechem would never And this vital observation is buttressed by the immediately succeeding context. If you notice in Genesis 35 verse 1, after this tragic incident, what happened? Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and live there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods which are among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments, and let us arise, and let us go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress, and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had, and the rings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak, which was in Shechem. Here God appeared to Jacob in Shechem. After the tragic incident in Shechem, God told Jacob, fulfill your vow. Go to Bethel. Build the altar there. And Jacob therefore had to urge his household to rid themselves of the idols that they have brought with them to Peter. To erect an altar there to the Lord and to fulfill his vow. If only he did not linger in Shechem. Bought a land, pitch his tent. If he just stay there for a while and immediately proceed to Peter, the place where God appeared to him, the place where he promised, where he knew was the house of God, this tragic incident would never happen. And that's something that the writer wants us to see in the way he narrates the story. So what is the intended or implied lesson of this? Well, the importance of keeping a vow. He made a vow. And brethren, listen. If you have made a vow to the Lord, then do not delay in keeping it by His grace and by the help of God. He takes seriously those vows. In Deuteronomy 23, 21, we read, When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For it would be sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. Also in Ecclesiastes 5 verses 4 to 5 we read, When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it. 
For he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you vow and not pay. And this is true of all the vows that you have made to and before the Lord. The personal vows that you may have made to the Lord, the marital vows that you have made to the Lord, the vows that you have made when you became a disciple of the Lord Jesus, the vows that you have made when you became a member of the church. You have to, to take those vows seriously. If you fail to keep them, if you are delinquent in fulfilling them, never take that lightly. Repent before the Lord. Ask His forgiveness. Seek to fulfill the vow or the vows with the grace and the strength that God Himself has promised to provide. This is what Jacob will later do in verse 31. And the Lord was gracious to him. In Genesis 35, when he finally fulfilled his vow, read his also with the foreign gods to fulfill his vow to worship God in Bethel as one whom he identifies, he and his household, as their God. So take those vows seriously. In connection with this, never take a rash vow before the Lord. Remember Ecclesiastes, when you make a vow, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you vow and not pay. Or Proverbs 20:24 20, says, It is a trap for a man to say rashly, It is holy. And after the vow, to make an inquiry. In other words, vow first and then think later. It's tragic. There are certain vows that you must make. And not making them would be sinful and wrong. For that is something that God requires. But before you make a vow, you have to seriously think about it. I have done a number of weddings. And there are those who make vows. And I wonder, have they really thought about those vows they're making? Have they really thought about that? You must count the cost. And when it comes to vows that the Lord does not require you to make, do not make it unless you are really serious about keeping it. Now, of course, what if the vow that you have made would mean that you would have to do something sinful in order to fulfill it? Well, what if you made a foolish vow like that of Jephthah made in Judges 11, the fulfilling of which would require that you violate the command of God? Well, repent of that foolish vow. And never make such a rush and foolish vow. Again. But God takes vows seriously. When Shechem failed to fulfill his vow, when Jacob, delaying in Shechem, that led to a tragic event in his life.
What about those who make a vow while under the authority of someone? Well, Numbers 30. And I want just, just to have a quick reading of this passage. Verse 1. Then Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the sons of Israel, saying, This is the word which the Lord has commanded. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Also, if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by an obligation in her father's house in her youth, and her father hears her vow and her obligation by which she has bound herself, and her father says nothing to her, then all her vows shall stand, and every obligation by which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father should forbid her on the day he hears of it, None of her vows or obligation by which she has bound herself shall stand. And the Lord will forgive her because her father had forbidden her. However, if she should marry while under, while under her vows or the rash statement of her lips by which she has bound herself and her husband hears of it and says nothing to her on the day, he hears of it. In other words, the head of the home does not annul the vow. And her vows shall stand, and her obligations by which she has bound herself shall stand. But if on the day her husband hears of it, he forbids her, then he shall annul her vow, which she is, which she is under, and the rash statement of her lips by which she has bound herself, and the Lord will forgive. But the vow of a widow, or a divorced woman, everything by which she has bound herself shall stand against her. However, if she bowed in her husband's house or bound herself by an obligation with an oath and her husband heard it but said nothing to her and did not forbid her, then all her vows shall stand and every obligation by which she bound herself shall stand. But if indeed her husband unrolls them on the day he hears them, then whatever proceeds out of her lips concerning her vow or concerning the obligation of herself shall not stand. Her husband has unrolled them, and the Lord will take it. Every vow, every binding oath to humble herself, her husband may confirm it or the husband may annul it. But if her husband indeed says nothing to her from day to day, then he confirms all her vows and all her obligations, which are on her. He has confirmed them because he said nothing to her on the day he heard it. But if he indeed annuls them after he has heard them, then he shall bear her guilt. You see, God takes seriously vows. And that is what the writer wants us to see in the way he narrates this story. Even Jacob was not spared. Never think you will be. Take your vows seriously. Our vow as your ministers, your vow as members. And whatever vows you make, take them seriously. But then that leads us to a second theological reflection and application of our passage. Not only the importance of a vow, but secondly, the propriety as well as danger of moral indignation. The propriety as well as danger of moral indignation. Again, although this is not an issue that the narrator or writer under the infallible guidance of the Spirit explicitly mentions in the narrative as an editorial comment, it is something clearly implied in the way the narrator 
relates the story the way he tells the story. Pay attention. The delaying of Jacob to fulfill his vow to the Lord by settling in Shechem instead of going to Bethel led to this tragic event. Shechem, son of Hamor, rapes Jacob's daughter. Dinah, look at verse 1 of Genesis 34. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. When Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he took her and lay with her by force. He was deeply attached to Dinah and the daughter, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this young girl for a wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. But his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob kept silent until they came in. Now, notice, when Jacob heard that Dinah, his daughter, had been raped, violated by Shechem, how did he respond? How did he react? We read again in verse 5, He heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob kept silent until they came in. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with them. Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very angry, because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by laying with Jacob's daughter for such a thing or not to be done. Note that when Jacob heard that Dinah, his daughter, was right, he just kept silent. In fact, no mention is even made that Jacob sent for his sons to come so that he will tell them about it. And as one commentator says, the narrator blanks how they heard, the sons of Jacob heard, but does not credit Jacob with summoning them or telling them. Apparently, Jacob does not view it important enough to send from But in contrast to Jacob's apparent indifference, the emotive responses of Dinah's brothers are carefully recorded. We are told that they were green and were very angry. This must be intentional or purposeful while Jacob appears rather emotionally indifferent about the matter the sons of Jacob were not they were angry they were green moreover the narrator or writer highlights this anomaly by dwelling on the heinousness of the crime committed against Dinah Look at verse 2 of Exodus, of Genesis 34. When Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he took her and lay with her by force. Now there are actually four verbs to describe this crime, this rape. Although the NASB and the NIV treats the last two as a hindiadis, just a repetition, and translates by using only three verbs, 
the NASB says, saw her, took her, lay with her by force. The NIV saw her, took her, and violated her. Three verbs. But this fails to capture the increasing brutality and heinousness of the crime did against Dinah. The ASB saw her, took her, lay with her, and humbled her. The ESB saw her, seized her, lay with her, and humbled her. Even better, the New King James saw her, took her, lay with her, and violated her. See, the writer wants us to linger long on what happened here and see the increasing brutality or heinousness of what happened to Jacob's daughter. Jacob, seemingly emotionally indifferent, he kept silent, waited for his sons to return, and the emotion, emotive response of the sons of Jacob are graphically described. They were grieved. They were very angry. And the writer wants to point out that the crime committed against her was really serious by describing the increasing brutality of what was done to her. And then notice in verse 5, in verse 5, now Jacob heard that he had, Shechem, had defiled Aina, his daughter. The word defiled, that is, to render her unclean. The choice of word to describe what happened to Dinah reveals the narrator's evaluation of the incident. This was not just an act of physical violence. This is an act of defiling. And the narrator wants us to see that under the infallible guidance of the Spirit. And again in verse 5. Okay? I'm sorry, verse 7. Notice how the story is told. In verse 7, Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very angry, because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by laying with Jacob's daughter for such a thing or not to be done. You see, the writer really wants us to feel the horribleness of what was done against them. The way the story is told, the narrator reveals evaluate, his evaluation of the incident. The fact that Shechem rape turned to love and his brutality turned to speaking tenderly to her. And the fact that he even wanted to marry Dinah after he raped her does not at all lessen the heinousness of the crime. In telling the story, the narrator's choice of words reveal how he evaluates the incident. This was a disgraceful act. It was an outrageous moral violation. Such thing all not to be done. And then in verse 13, again the writer, under the infallible guidance of the Spirit, in verse 13, now Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor with deceit because he had defiled Dinah. Again, the description and repetition indicates the narrator's evaluation of the crime committed. This act must be viewed as an outrageous 
moral violation. Furthermore, the narrator or writer highlights this anomaly of Jacob's indifferent reaction towards this heinous crime against Dinah by repeatedly emphasizing that Dinah was Jacob's daughter. Look how he repeats that again and again so that we will always view her in the light of her relationship with Jacob and the anomaly of Jacob's response. Verse 1. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob. And then in verse 3, he was deeply attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. We already know that. He keeps repeating that. And then in verse 5, then Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. And then in verse 7, Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by laying with Jacob's daughter. He keeps reminding us who she is. The narrator, in verse 11, Shechem also said to her father and said to her brothers, If I find favor in your sight, then I will give whatever you ask, whatever you say to me. Let me see. Uh, Verse 13. Let me see. Wait a minute. Verse 19. Notice again, the young man did not delay to do the thing because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now, when you see repetitions like that, you know that the narrator, under the infallible guidance of the Spirit, wants to remind us again and again and again this relationship Jacob had with that woman who was raped. It's not just anybody, not her servant. It's his daughter. Why the repeated mention? Well, it would seem that the reason is to highlight the anomaly of Jacob's rather indifferent emotional response to the rape of time. But in contrast to Jacob's indifference, the emotional response or the emotive response of his sons to the rape of Dina is given some justification by also repeatedly emphasizing that Dina or Dina was their sister. Verse 13, verse 25, I'm sorry, verse 13, verse 25, verse 27, verse 32. Verse 13, notice, the writer says, And Jacob's sons answered Shechem, his father Hamor, with deceit because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. Verse 25. These are the clues you want to look at in a narrative. Now it came about on the third day when they were in pain that the two sons of the two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, each took his sword and came in upon the city. And then in verse 27, Jacob's sons came upon the slain and looted the city because they defiled, they had defiled their sister. And then verse 31, in response to Jacob, but they said, should he treat our sister as a harlot? 
So although the writer is not necessarily justifying what the brothers did, and we will come back to that later, yet the writer is also giving some justification of what they did by repeatedly, and their anger, I'm sorry, is giving a justification of their anger by repeatedly emphasizing that Dinah was their sister. They loved her. Then finally, the narrator highlights this anomaly of Jacob's indifference by recording what Jacob was only concerned about and by giving two of Jacob's sons the last word in rebuking Jacob's indifference. Look at verse 24. Okay? Ola went out of the gate of the city, listened to Hamor and his son, Shechem, and every male was circumcised. Ola went out of the gate. Okay? In verse 30, Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me ujus among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Parasites, and my men being few in number, they will gather together against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed, I and my household. That's what he's concerned about. But they said, should he treat our sister as a harlot? Jacob, when Jacob speaks, he speaks more of fear rather than faith. And the narrate, and he speaks more of his personal interests than what happened to her. And the narrator gives the two sons of Jacob the last word in order to highlight their, that their indignation, their anger had some justification. Now, does the moral outrage that Shechem did justify what the sons of Jacob did to him and the people of Shechem? No. Did it justify their mean deception, their lying to them, their killing all males in Shechem, their act of destroying and plundering the city and the people of Shechem? No! And later in Genesis, the narrator under the infallible guidance of the Spirit that does not want us at all to miss that point. In Genesis 46, when Jacob gives his word prophetic word about the future of his children. What do we read? So Israel went out with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am. I am the God of your father, Abraham. Okay? When he gives his final word of blessing, let me see. Forty-nine, not forty-six, forty-nine. And the writer doesn't want us to think that what the brothers of Jacob did in their anger was justifiable. Verse 1, Jacob summoned his sons and said, Assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. This is a prophetic word. Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. And then Reuben is addressed in verse 3. And then in verse 5, Simeon and Levi. Our brothers, their swords 
are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their counsel. Let not my glory be united with their assembly. Because in their anger they slew men. And in their self-will they lame oxen. Curse be their anger, for it is fierce. And their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So there is no justification for what they did as a result of their moral outrage. Besides, in the law God gave to the nation of Israel, when it was formed into a covenant nation, what was the penalty of rape and for kidnapping? For rape, the death penalty for the rapists. Deuteronomy 22, 25 to 27. For kidnapping, it was the death penalty for the kidnapper. Exodus 21, 13. In their anger, Simeon and Levi went far, far beyond. What would be an appropriate response? But still, Jacob's indifference was anomalous. It was wrong. It was utterly inexcusable. When worrying about what will happen to him as a result of what Simeon and Levi did, his sons rebuked him. Should he treat our sister as a harlot? So what is the intended, although implied, lesson of this passage? Well, the propriety as well as the danger of moral indignation. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry, and yet do not sin. Or when you are angry, do not sin. There is a proper place for anger. Not to be angry in the face of an outrageous moral violation is not to be godly. That was the problem of Jacob. Although God is slow to anger, and yet sin stirs up the righteous anger of God. And that was the problem of Jacob. He did not love Dinah enough to be angry of what happened to her. He did not love righteousness enough to be angry at the outrageous moral violation committed against his own daughter. And that was wrong. But although there is a proper place for anger or moral indignation, we must also watch that we sin, we do not sin in our anger by doing something not warranted by God. And here, we must keep the proper balance. Be angry when there is an outrageous moral violation. But in your anger or moral indignation, be careful that you do not sin. See, there are some books who make it appear as if if someone is angry, that's it. No. It's ungodly not to be angry in the face of moral. Outrageous moral violation. But in your anger, be careful that you do not sin. This was the sin of Moses in the waters of Meribah. He lost control of himself in his anger and, fight and did not treat God as holy. 
He disobeyed what God commanded him to do. He went beyond and did something not warranted by God. And God was not pleased with that. So keep the balance. And never misjudge someone angry simply because he is angry. It must be wrong. No. That was the problem of Jacob. But then you don't also want to go to the other extreme where you lose control of your anger and you do something that is not warranted by God. You trample upon commandments. You trample upon directives. You think that you can shortcut certain things because in your anger you have lost control. The propriety as well as the danger of moral indignation. But then there is a third. That leads us to a third theological reflection and application of the incident recorded in this passage. Not only the need to keep the vow, the importance, not only the propriety as well as danger of moral indignation, but then thirdly, the necessity of godly leadership. The necessity of godly leadership. And again, although this is not an issue that the narrator or writer explicitly mentions in a narrative as an editorial comment, it is something clearly implied in the way the writer records the event, the way he tells the story. Remember that all along, prior to this incident, the narrator highlights that Jacob has been an active and good leader to his household. Coming back to Canaan, what to do when they will meet Esau. He was the one at the helm, giving direction, making the plans, implementing those plans. But then suddenly, Jacob fails to provide godly leadership. In his household. Look at again. 33 verses 18. Now Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem. Which is in the land of Canaan. And when he came from Padam Aram. And camped before the city. He bought the piece of land. Where he had pitched his tent. From the land of the sons of Hamor. Shechem's father. For one hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it El Eloi Israel. Now notice, observe that the city of Shechem, Shechem is further described as that which is in the land of Canaan. Well this is already obvious from the context. But the writer emphasizes that this city is in the land of Canaan. And to better the words of another, this tautology, this needless repetition, because we already know that Shechem is in the land of Canaan from the context because Jacob has returned to Canaan, but this tautology alerts the reader to the wickedness of the area. Genesis 19. Moreover, we are told that Jacob camped before the city, verse 18, or literally camped within the sight of the city. Near the city, within sight. Again, this is reminiscent of what Lot did when he pitched his tent near the city of Sodom. Genesis 19. Furthermore, Jacob decided to stay longer in that place because we are told that he bought the land where he pitched his tent. He was not there intending just for a temporary stay. He bought the land. For 100 pieces of money. This indicates that Jacob was not just passing through. He was 
really wanted to settle there at least for a while. He bought the land. And while dwelling near the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, and God was about to vomit them out of that land because of its wickedness. Jacob fails to provide care and protection for his daughter. 34 verse 1. Now, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. When Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hevite, the prince of the land, saw her, he took her, lay with her, and violated her. Would be a literal rendering. Okay? What did Dinah do? What Dinah did here was highly inappropriate It was highly imprudent. As one commentator says, girls of marriageable age would not normally leave a rural encampment to go unchaperoned into an alien city. Rebecca and Rachel going out to a well owned by the clan is quite different from going out and chaperoned among Canaanites. They are called daughters of the land. She was a stranger to them. They were strangers to her. And as a father, it was Jacob's duty to see to it that Dinah would be chaperoned. But the narrator mentions none and implies the failure of Jacob to provide care and protection for his daughter in a place where he knows it was dangerous. This is a failure of Jacob's leadership. And even worse, when Dinah was raped or violated, Jacob does not really take action. He manifested passivity. Note verse 3 of chapter 34. He was deeply attracted, that is Shechem, to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor saying, Give me this young girl for a wife. Verse 5. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah's daughter. But his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob kept silent until they came. Until they came in. And then notice verse 6. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak. As already noted earlier, Jacob shows no moral indignation when he heard that his daughter was raped or defiled. Moreover, we are not told that he took the initiative to go to Shechem or to his father, Hamor. It was Shechem's father who went to talk to Jacob. Not take action. And there is more in verse 7 to 8. Notice, now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by laying with Jacob's daughter for such a thing ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, My soul, the soul of my son Shechem, longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Intermarry with us. But then who answers to that? Verse 13. But Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor with deceit because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. They said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised. Jacob is silent. The sons 
negotiated. Although the request was addressed to Jacob, he's just passive, he's silent. His son took the helm of leadership to negotiate deceitfully. As already noted, the narrator doesn't even credit Jacob for summoning his sons to tell them what happened to Dinah. We are just told that when they heard, they were grieved, they were very angry. Moreover, when Hamer talked to Jacob and his son, Jacob leaves it to his son to decide what to do. To make the negotiations. They were the ones who made a plan to deceive the people of Shechem without even the knowledge of Jacob. To have their adult males circumcise themselves so that three days when the most, when the pain, when they are in the highest point of their pain, Then they can attack and ransack the city. Jacob failed to provide and take the leadership in this situation. He was willing to just be passive and go along whatever the outcome might be. Let my sons negotiate. And when Jacob realized the real intention behind his son's negotiating condition and rebuked particularly Simeon and Levi for what they did, their counter-rebuke leaves Jacob without an answer. In verse 30, when he knew what was really behind those negotiations. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Parasites, and my men are few in number, and they will gather against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed, I and my household. But they said, Should he treat our sister as a heart? And Jacob's mouth is shut. The last words came from his son. Jacob had no reply. His passivity and failure to provide strong and godly leadership rendered him speechless. What is the intended, although implied, lesson of this? The necessity of godly leadership. We should not absolve Dinah's impropriety and imprudence by blaming it on Jacob's passivity and failure in leadership. She had her fault. Nor should we absolve Simeon and Levi's sinful moral indignation in going far beyond what was appropriate and blaming it on Jacob's failure and passivity. No. As later God judged them for their actions. Genesis 49. But neither should we lessen the guilt of Jacob's failure in leadership. He failed to provide the kind of leadership he should have shown as a father and head of his home. And the consequence was terrible for Dinah and for his two sons, Simeon and Levi. Their future. Therefore, providing godly leadership is essential. And we must not fail in this. If God has put you in a position of leadership, 
in the home. We cannot take that responsibility lightly. Acting passively, not actively thinking about just simply going along with whatever is happening, whatever might be the outcome. Providing godly leadership is essential. If you're a father, if you're a single mother, you can't put jeopardy the future of your children by failing in your role. Dinah, his daughter, his son, Simeon, Levi. Curse be your anger that will affect the future. And the leadership was not handed to them. It was handed to Judah. Because they are not controllable in their anger. And that would affect even future generation of their sons. Therefore, providing leadership is essential. And you must not fail in this. This is true of our homes. Because we have the tendency to think fatalistically. But the Bible never allows us. This story bears it down on our conscience. That our failures in leadership will have, could have devastating consequences on our children. On the church. In our workplace, whatever position of leadership, we must take that seriously and not fail as Jacob failed. Now that leads us to the fourth and final theological reflection and application of the passage. Not only the need to keep a vow or this tragic event would never have happened. Not only the propriety and danger of moral indignation, the failure to be morally indignant embodied in Jacob, the danger of sinful indignation embodied in his sons. The necessity of godly leadership, but then fourthly and finally, also in this passage, we see the sovereign and gracious rule of God. You see, Jacob's failure, again, this is a theological point highlighted repeatedly, particularly in the stories in Genesis, the book of beginnings. And it's again highlighted in this passage. You see, Jacob's failure in leadership put the separateness of his physical descendants in danger with merging with the Canaanites. And from the canonical context of the five books of Moses, this would have been a disaster. Jacob's camp. Jacob camped before the city of Shechem. He even decided to settle down there for a while by buying the land where he pitched his tent from Hamor. He failed to care and protect his daughter, Dinah. From the dangerous exposure to the Canaanites. 
And when Hamor, Shechem's father, negotiates with Jacob and his sons to become one people with them, Jacob passively just goes along. What was the proposition? Look at verse 8. And you can hear alarm bells in these negotiations. In verse 8. But Hamor spoke with them saying, My soul or the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Intermarry with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. Thus you shall live with us and the land shall be open before you. Live and trade in it and acquire property in it. Okay? And then notice how Jacob's sons answered. Jacob's sons, verse 13, answered Shechem and his father Hamor with deceit because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. And they said to him, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised. For that would be a disgrace. Only in this condition we will consent to If you become like us, and that every male of you be circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you. And we will take your daughters for ourselves. And we will live with you and become one people. Verse 18. And the words seem reasonable to Hamor and Shechem. And Shechem, Hamor's son, the young man did not delay to go to do the thing because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was more respected than all the household of his father. And then when they talk, verse 26 or 21, the men were friend, the men are friendly with us. Let us live in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage and give our daughters to them. Only on this condition will men consent to live with us to become one people. That every male among us be circumcised if they are circumcised. Will not their livestock and their property and all their animals be ours? Only let us consent to them and they will live with us. Now that sends alarm bells if you are familiar with the wider context of Genesis. That should send alarm bells. This is dangerous negotiation. From the standpoint of the five books of Moses, this would have been a disaster. Jacob did not see the need to keep his physical descendants separate from the Canaanites and avoid merging with the people of the land. Remember Genesis 24? They expect the writer, the narrator, does not expect us to forget this. When we read, okay, Genesis 24 and verse 2. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household who had Charge to all that he owned, please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. But you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son, Isaac. Why? Abraham knew he had to keep his household separate from the Canaanites. They cannot intermarry. In chapter 26, 34. And this is again repeated. This is again emphasized. 26, 24. Sorry, let me see. 
If you notice, when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Biri, the Hittite, the Canaanite clan, and Basma, the daughter of Elam, the Hittite, and they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. It was a grief to them. 27, 46. This is a recurring theme in the book of Genesis. Rebecca said to Isaac, I am tired of living because of the daughters of Heath. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heath like these, the wives of Esau, from the daughters of the land, Canaan, what good will my life be to me? And then chapter 28, verse 1, So J Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise! Go to Padamaram, to the house of Bithril, your mother's father. And from there, take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's father. This is a theme that is repeated in the book of Genesis. And this theme is further developed in the other four books of Moses. So here, Jacob's failure in leadership and his passivity put his physical descendants in danger of merging with the Canaanite people. He just went along. He did not know that his sons were lying, deceiving, but he went along the negotiation as a passive observer. There were no bells ringing alarm, ringing in his ears. And this would have been a disaster concerning God's plan of salvation. But just when you think God's plan of salvation would because of the failure of Jacob's leadership. The sinful moral indignation of the sons of Jacob was what God used to keep the physical descendants of Jacob from merging with the Canaanites. Look at what he said. Jacob 34.30 After the incident of massacre, then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Parasites. And my men being few in number, they will gather together against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed, I and my household. And he said, Should he treat our sister as a harlot? The Canaanites would never like Jacob. They will hear of what his sons did to Shechem. And they will never trust Jacob. They will never form an alliance with him. Now, this does not absolve the sons of Jacob, particularly Simeon and Levi, of the wrong that they did. God held them responsible and accountable for them, as clear from the prophetic words of Jacob, Concerning his son's future, Genesis 49 that we read. But the event also shows the sovereign and gracious rule of God. He ordained and used even the sinful and free actions of men, particularly Simeon and Levi, in their unrighteous indignation because it we went beyond the limits of propriety. They did something that was beyond what was right in order to serve his good and wise purpose to keep Jacob from merging with Canaan. And that's the wonder of God. 
Let us never forget that vital lesson. The Bible is full of them. You can't absolve Jacob for his failure. A consequence to his daughter and to his sons. It will remain. You cannot absolve the wrong that Simeon and Levi did. In their moral indignation, they went beyond what was appropriate. And that will affect their future. But the event God also used in order to keep Jacob separate and that the nation will not merge with the Canaanites. The sinful act of his sons God used to keep Jacob's household separate. And never forget that vital lesson. No matter how dark, there is always a silver lining. The Bible is full of them. If you are a believer, what source of comfort this is? In Romans 8.28, For we know that God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. This does not mean that we will be necessarily spared from pain and suffering because of our foolish and sinful actions and failure. We will. This does not mean that our children will not suffer for our own moral failures in leadership. They can. But God will still cause all things to work together for good to those who love Him. For those who are called according to His purpose. The salvation of Jacob through one of his descendants, Messiah, will be fulfilled. For God will ensure in his faithfulness it will be fulfilled. And let us never forget that vital lesson. This is the wonder of God. This is what makes him glorious. No matter how painful the consequence of our failures, God still causes all things to work. To advance his cause that will benefit ultimately all those who are the objects of his saving grace and mercy. What a comfort that is. That's the marvel. And remember that if you are still a hater of God, a stranger of His saving grace, remember that you cannot rebel against Him and win. Even your rebellion, God will use to serve His good and wise purpose. And then, You will be judged for the wrong that you did. You will never be a winner. You will always be a loser. The only way to win is to be reconciled to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Because no matter how many mistakes you make, no matter what be the painful consequence of your failures, God will still cause all things to work together for good for those who love Him. And for Jacob, this is true for Jacob. It was the very simple acts of his son that God used in order that Jacob will never merge with the Canaanites. 
and that God will continue his plan of salvation until Messiah would come who will accomplish salvation. And that would include the salvation of Jacob. And from this incident in Jacob's life, remember the vital lessons intended in the way the story is told. The importance of keeping it wow. Never take those light. The propriety and yet danger of moral indignation. The necessity of godly leadership and the sovereign and gracious rule of God.